want to welcome everyone who's watching on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, or listening on podcast. While you can see me up here, there's hundreds of people that you can see, and they love God. So if you're alone, just remember, you're not alone. Not only is God with you, but there's hundreds of people here who are for you. So God bless you. If you do feel a bit isolated, may God give you a sense of a bigger family who are for you. Who'll say amen? amen? Let's give a round of applause to everyone watching in or listening in. God bless you. I'm going to talk today about a, a word I'm calling water daughter. It's about the daughter of, a, of Abraham's nephew. Abraham was a famous man in the Bible. He goes way back and he founded, if you will, the beginnings of the Jewish faith. And as Christians, that was our roots. We came out of that faith originally. And it's all about this daughter, this girl, and her name was Rebecca, and how she did something incredible, and God used it, and it was to do with water. And water is just an everyday commodity. It's something you can find anywhere. You and I come into contact with water every day of our lives, and we carry a lot of water, even in our bodies. But God did something with water, with this daughter, with Rebecca, and I want to look at it and see how that has something to do with us. Am I on? There we go. So we're going to look at, no we're not, it's gone back. We're going to look at Genesis 24, and the context of this, if you're new to the Bible, and I know many here are, it's where Abraham, this great hero of faith, is getting old, and he's got a son who isn't married. And he was eager to see that his son would find a good wife. It's good to find a good wife, brothers, isn't it? Would the brothers say amen? The girls can't say it. I want to hear all deep voices say amen. One, two, three. There was a few women now. Women, you're not allowed to say amen. This is only the lads. One, two, three. Amen. There's still some girls saying amen. Yvonne, you're going to be thrown out of here. <laughs> and it's good for girls to find a good husband. Would the girls say amen? amen. Oh, we've all the extrovert girls over here and you're very quiet down there, whatever's going on. So he wanted his son to find a good wife. The problem is, where they were living, the women weren't good. They were involved in devil worship, we'll call it that. They were terribly immoral. They were riddled with sexual diseases because of their lifestyle. It really was a sick society, maybe a bit like the world we live in today. The world we live in today is fairly sick. But in the midst of sick societies, just like us all over Ireland, all over the world, God is raising up colonies of heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. An invasion of the future into the present here on planet Earth, where the people of God have a higher way of living, Amen. a better way of living, a way that brings healing and delivers us from our fears. Hallelujah. So he wanted to find a daughter for his son. And back then, the way you did it was you got your trusted servant to go finding it. So really, if you were looking for a husband or wife, you just had to sit back and let the family sort it out. It was, it was a family thing, you know? So you could be at home sleeping or something and they were doing all the hard work. I don't know, there's a lot to be said for it anyway. <laughs> Actually, if you go to India today, um, a lot of the families, I think 90% of the families will arrange the marriages with the man and woman's consent, obviously. And there's just a lot of wisdom in it. Anyway, so this is the context of it, and it's a conversation and a journey that took place. So I'm just going to pray that the Spirit of God would bring every word alive today. Amen. And that whatever is from God would take root in our souls. Amen. Whatever is just from me would soon be forgotten. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this is Genesis 24. Abraham asked his trusted senior servant, Eliezer, swear to me that the Lord, by the Lord, that you won't take a wife for my son from the local Canaanite women. 
But you'll go to my clan's country, my wider family's country, and you'll find a wife for Isaac from there. That was his son. Only don't let him go down there. Your man was 40 now, like, so. <laughs> There's hope. <laughs> There's hope. There is. So Eliezer swore to Abram on this, and he took 10 camels, as you do, and he went there taking many wonderful gifts with him. And when they arrived on the edge of that city, he made the camels kneel down by the water well, and he prayed, O oh God of Abraham, grant me success and show me your kindness today. Let the young woman to whom I will say, can you give me a drink of water? Also offer to give water to my camels. Let her, let her, let her be the one, be the one you have chosen as Isaac's wife. And before he'd even finished praying, Rebecca, granddaughter of Abraham's brother, came and started filling her water pot. Please, can you give me a drink of water, he asked her. Yes, of course, she answered, and poured him a cup of water. As soon as he had finished drinking, she said to him, let me also get water for your camels. So she emptied her water pot into the animal drinking trough and ran and ran and ran back again to the well for more water until all the camels had drunk their fill. Eliezer looked at her in amazement, silently praying to learn if the Lord had prospered his journey. Hallelujah. So what we read straight away, guys, is that Abram asked this trusted servant to go to the clan's country to find a wife for Isaac from there. So Abraham had originally come many decades earlier from an area today, kind of the Syria-Iraq border down there that way. And God had led him on a journey to the promised land. What was the name of the promised land? Canaan. Canaan. And that land then became? Israel. Israel. So we would know it as Israel today. And God led him there miraculously. And this was the promised land. But when he was there, the local Canaanites, as I said, lived a very different lifestyle. How can two walk together unless they are in agreement, the Bible says. So how can we marry someone who's totally against Christianity? if we are Christians, or who has no interest. They want to go drinking and getting drunk or getting high or something, and you want to go to church and keep your head and your heart clean. It, it, it's very difficult. And that's us today. So it was the same back then. So he trusts this man. What we need to know is that this man could have financially inherited everything if Abraham didn't have a son. Abraham at this stage was probably one of the most wealthiest men in that area. God had blessed him. What does the Bible say? Riches are a blessing from the Lord. Striving has nothing to do with it. So because he loved God and he put God first, God blessed him. You look after God's business, he look after your business. Seek first who? And his and all these things will be added unto you. You might go, who's this gangster saying that? Don't take my word for it. Check it out yourself. It's in the Bible for thousands of years. Check out what Jesus says. So he asks him, will you go and find a wife? Look at what happened. We first meet this man, Eliezer, in five chapters earlier. Back then, Abraham was panicking. He didn't have a son. And he said, Lord, if I continue to be childless, then my servant, Eliezer of Damascus, he will be my heir. He'll get everything. And while God answered Abraham's prayer and Isaac was born, this man, Eliezer, if he was like a lot of people you and I know, he'd have had a grudge against Isaac. If that fecker hadn't been born, I'd have inherited everything. But no. See, he's a spiritual man. He sees beyond just his own immediate thing. He sees there's a bigger picture going on and that God's hand is on this family's life. So Eliezer, Eliezer 
was a noble guy with a lot of spirituality. So he swears to Abraham that he will do his best to bring back a wife. And he had asked Abraham, he said, look, if nobody shows up, what am I to do? And Abraham says, well, then you're released from your promise. So he travels there, we're told, in verse 10 and 11. He took 10 camels and he traveled there taking many wonderful gifts with him. And he arrived at the well on the city's edge. Ten camels drink a lot of water, okay? So we kind of see what this girl did. He went all the ways there and he took wonderful gifts. I don't have time to go into it, but the book of Genesis is an incredibly fascinating foreshadow, mathematically, literature-wise, prophecy-wise, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Written thousands of years earlier, there is a father who had an only son. The son, if you will, died. Isaac was put on the altar, but rose again, just as Heavenly Father sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. Jesus rose again. Abraham had only Isaac. He put him on the altar, and the angel rescued him. And the son needed a wife. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, at the second coming, will marry a bride and this is figuratively speaking and the, who is the bride anyone know church. it's the church it's everyone who loves jesus it's not just this community it's all those who are born again say born again born again, born again. Born again. oh hallelujah if you are born again heaven is your home Heaven is our home. If, we, if you've never been born again, I promise you, I promise you without fear of contradiction, God's will is for you to have that experience too. Like th hundreds and thousands who come to this church, he wants you to have that experience and many other churches. And it says, when Jesus comes back again, there will be a marriage feast where the bride, the church, will connect with Jesus. And so here we have the promised son, the only son, and the bride being bought to him. And the bride will be bought to Jesus at the second coming. There will be a second coming. Yeah. Jesus will come again. This world will end. If your heart and your future is this world, you are pathetic, is what the Bible says. You're a pity, because we've something far greater than anything this world has to offer. Did you know that what's happening in Israel, you should watch that closely because so many of the prophecies in the Bible about the end of the age are all to do with that nation. Yes. Armageddon, and most of you know that, is actually a physical place out there. So, so much of what's happening. And so when there's catastrophe happening in this land, when I read it, I said, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, is this it? Is this it? Be ready. Be ready, because none of us know the day or the hour. If all it is is your job, if all it is is my money, if all it is is my experiences of happiness or whatever, there is something greater at play. So what's happening in Israel mightn't be something, but it might be. And we should be ready. The second coming of Jesus, when he will come again, and all those who love him will be caught up. Hallelujah. And we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. Hallelujah. It's called the blessed hope. Who will say hallelujah? hallelujah? It is your blessed hope. It is my blessed hope. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. You and I have a future. And it has nothing to do with the economy. It has nothing to do with the government. It has nothing to do with celebrities. It has everything to do with Jesus. Amen. And when he comes again, all those who love him will be caught up with him. And all those who don't love him will go to hell. Amen. And a lot of people say, you can't say that. I'm not saying it. The Bible says it. Jesus warned about hell more than he even mentioned heaven. And that's not bad news. The good news is he's only a prayer away. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm going to give the opportunity before the meeting ends in all privacy for people to ask Jesus to come into their lives. Why? Someone said to me a while back, why are you always doing it? Because I don't want to see anyone go to hell. We want to see as many people as possible with their future in heaven. 
Amen. Amen. And it's not just the joy of heaven, it's the blessing here on earth, where we have the joy of the Lord, where we've got a power that's not our own, where we have peace. Yes. If you don't have peace with God, if I don't have peace with God, I can't have peace with myself. And if I'm not at peace with myself, my body gets sick, my mind gets sick. Make your peace with God. It's worth anything. The wonderful gifts are also a long way around. The wonderful gifts are a symbol, are a foreshadow of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, prophecy, divine healing, miracles, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discernment of spirits that could go on. So this is a foreshadow, a symbol of the gifts of the spirit being brought to the bride. You and I, God has given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are the bride, speaking figuratively. And so he brings wonderful gifts with him. And he comes to the edge of the city. And at the edge of the city was the well, the well in this city. And you should know, in that climate, the women drew the water. They took the water from the well. And they always went out early in the morning. And they would take the water from the well for the day. And then they'd go out again later in the evening to get water for the night. If a man did it, it was very unusual. And that's why Jesus said to his followers, just before the Passover meal, and he said, go to this well and you'll see a man carrying water. That was so unusual, there was only one man doing it. So it was mainly the women. So he knew he was to go there, and just look at his journey. If he, he was going from the very south of Israel, near where all the trouble is right now, near Gaza, and he was going right up into Syria, Iraq, and it's 1,450 kilometers, one way double it for a wrong journey. That's 900 miles on camels, on camels. And so it's a long journey and he's finally come and he did not arrive and go, I'm after doing loads of work here. I need to put my feet up and have a week off. No, the guy gets straight to it because it was so important. And look at his prayer. Lord, grant me success and show me your kindness. Do you know, I just feel by the Holy Spirit, we're to pray that now for you. Amen. Grant you success Amen. and may God show you his kindness. Amen. Are you up for that prayer? Yes. I'm gonna do what Craig Cooney did last week. If you wanna pray, just put your hand on your heart into your life, into your week ahead. May God grant you success in whatever you do and may God show you his kindness. Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 I pray this every morning, by the way. I keep praying this prayer. He then went on. Let the young woman, it was mainly younger women went to the well, to whom I will say, can you give me a drink of water? Let her also offer to give water to my camels. Let her be the one you have chosen as Isaac's wife. And that's his prayer. Now what's going on here? This is what we sometimes call the sign of the fleece. If you're somewhat new to Christianity, you might hear Christians talking to one another and saying, I'm putting the fleece before the Lord. I remember hearing it a couple of months after I had become a Christian. And I said, a fleece, what are they talking about? So a fleece is like a, an animal skin. Let's say like on the screen here, if you're listening on podcast, we've got a sheep skin on the ground, something like that. And this is basically where you want to be sure of God's will in your life. It's something should happen that will be remarkable but possible. Remarkable but possible. It comes from the book of Judges and a guy called Gideon. And some of the mature Christians will know the scripture well. God had asked Gideon to lead the army of Israel and he wasn't sure. So Gideon said to God, if you really want me to lead and save Israel from this enemy... Behold, I am laying a fleece on the floor. If in the morning, if in the morning, there's dew, that's the moisture of the night, dew on the fleece, but not on the floor around it, then, then, then I will know that this is your will. What he was doing, he was asking for something remarkable, but still possible. 
depending on the climatic conditions in that climate, sometimes, occasionally, the climate was such that an animal's skin would hold onto the moisture longer than the ground. Usually it didn't. It was unusual, but it was possible. And that's exactly what happened. And then Gideon knew this was God's will for his life. And perhaps some of us need to pray that prayer. We need to know, what does God want me to do? Why is that important? Because if God wants it, it's the best for you. We'll say amen. amen. If we just make it up out of our own head, we can't trust that. But if God is in it, if God is in it, we can be certain this is the best thing for us. I remember years ago, it was the late 1980s, I was in a house in Douglas and I was doing a Bible study and I was talking about this scripture about the Jew or the fleece and Gideon and I was talking about laying a fleece before the Lord. And a woman there, the following week, said something and then came back to me and said, do you know, I was hearing what you said about the fleece, so I said, maybe I should go and live in Israel. I said, right. So she said, I said I'd put a fleece before the Lord. I said, okay. So she said, I hung out the washing on the line. I said, Lord, if it starts raining, I know then that you want me to go to Israel. And I said, hello, this is Ireland. We're not in the Negev desert or the Sahara. Hello, we get loads of lovely rain here. That's not a fleece. Go out at you, Cotter. That's not the Lord. It has to be remarkable, but possible. Now, if you don't want to do something, you say, Lord, I want an angel with fire in his eyes to appear in my bedroom. Get out of it. That's not a real fleece either. It has to be possible. I'm not saying an angel can't appear, but it's very, very out there. So, you know, be reasonable in knowing God's will. Back to the story, we're told he hadn't even finished praying. I love when prayers are answered like that. <laughs> Rebecca came and started filling her water pot. That's verse 15. And as soon, and he asked her for a drink, she gave him a drink. As soon as he had finished drinking, Rebecca said, Let me also get water for your camels. So she ran to the well for more water until all the camels had enough to drink. Now, he didn't say to her, listen, could you give me a hand here? I'm an old man. I don't think I can carry all the water. Could you help me? And he would definitely have had helpers with him. Ten camels. You need other men with you. And this is the thing. Rebecca didn't say, there's a whole load of hairy fellas there with muscles in them. They can get the water. No, no. She said, let me get water for your camels. And look at this. It just tells you. Her body language, our body language, tells us what's going on in our hearts. She ran. She didn't kind of walk with attitude. <laughs> this one looking for water. I mean, she wasn't Irish. You know these guys weren't Irish. Because if they were Irish, uh, she'd have said, do you want me to get water for your camels, like? And he'd say, not at all, no, no. Oh, no, I really will, I really will. And everyone knows she doesn't mean it. The Irish play a game, don't we? We kind of... You know, ah, you will, you will, you will, you won't, you won't, you won't. They weren't Irish at all. She said it as she meant it. Let me get also water for your camels. And she ran. She didn't just walk with attitude, she ran. And she brought up the water to all of these camels. Remember now, she didn't just turn the tap. This is like, you've got to put the, your, your water jar down. Here's what, if you look at it, a camel will normally drink at a go 100 litres of water. 10 camels by 100 litres is 1,000 litres of water. That is at least an hour of running and carrying a heavy weight. Water is heavy. For a stranger. Honestly, I'm there and I'm going, would I do this? Do you know, I hope I would. I hope I would. But it shows you that God was all over this. He didn't know she was Abraham's grandniece. She was Abraham's granny. You know, I was thinking of this scripture. I was doing my nephew's wedding out in Spain a few weeks ago. And I was getting to know my brother's grandchildren a bit more. I'd met them once or twice. But I was chatting to the kids. And uh, I had one of them, my grandnephew and my grandniece. And the little grandniece, she's nearly six. She was telling me all her stories. And I was just thinking, you know, we're connected by blood. And I thought of Abraham and how Rebecca was the only other person from his clan who really went on with God. 
yeah, there was a lot, but he was all over the place. But she was his grandniece. And so here we see something incredible. You might go, are these two cousins marrying now? Like, yes. But the genetic pool wasn't as broken then as it is now. So the second cousins, whatever they were, wasn't as big a deal as it would be today. So this girl really went all the way. And look, Eliezer looked at her intently and in amazement, silently praying to learn if the Lord had prospered his journey. And I'm going to stop that account there today. Do you think the Lord prospered his journey? Yes. Oh, yes. Something incredible that actually bore impact on the future of the world, including us today. If this divine appointment hadn't happened, I don't even know would we be here today. It all goes back to this incredible God-appointed meet-up where a girl with a giving heart meets up with a man who was sent to find a wife and to see if this was God's will. Rebecca was a giver. I like what um, Rick Warren, famous pastor and author, said, said, we are healed to help others. Amen. How about a bit louder, amen? amen? We are blessed to be a blessing. Amen. We are saved to serve. Amen. Not just to sit around waiting for heaven. There's times, of course, we need to sit before God and wait before him. Of course there is. But if that's our whole identity, something is wrong. God is caught. You're better than that. You're greater than that. I'm greater than that. God is a destiny for every man and every woman who loves them. Amen. So what happened here is that there was a divine appointment where, because of the prayer, Eliezer met with Rebecca. I remember when I started my spiritual journey. I was 19, and I had, in a weird way, met some Christians who I kind of knew, uh, I knew them before they were Christian. They invited me to a meeting and I was touched at it, but I didn't kind of go any further. And I just kind of put the experience in a box and really forgot about it. And about a month later, where I was working, they, I had to work late and so they gave me the keys. So I was a key holder for a few days. And uh, I was working there and I finished on my own and I locked the front door and I came home and I lived about 20 minutes walk up the Poladuff Road near the lock. And I went home and I was home for half an hour, my parents' home, and I suddenly realised I never locked the side door. I locked the front door. There was no such thing as burglar alarms back then. So I had to go down back to the building where I worked to lock the side door. As fast as my legs would carry me, I ran back. I thanked God in as much as I knew there was a God there that no one had broken in. I locked the door. The boss didn't know any different. Hallelujah. So I'm walking home, kind of relieved. And who do I bump into but a guy that I knew from school, primary school. And I just bumped into him by accident. He had been at this Christian meeting. And he just stopped me, and I'm never on the road. I was never out walking at that time. He stopped and he started chatting to me, and he invited me to the Christian church again. It was a house church. And I remember him telling me about it, and I knew God was speaking through him for me. He had no agenda. Do you know what? That was a divine appointment. Because of that situation, because I forgot to lock the door, because I found myself on the street and I bumped into him. I went to another Christian meeting. When I was there, God melted my heart. I remember crying, and I don't cry easy, but I wept there, and I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I was born again that night. I can give you the date, the 28th of April, 1980. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It changed my life. It changed my future. The whole trajectory of everything that was going to happen change because I bumped into that guy. Not only that, my girlfriend became a Christian. She's not my wife, Denise. Yay. Hallelujah. My sister became a Christian. Some of the guys working with me became Christians. And you know what? The guy I bumped into ended up marrying my sister. So it was a blessing for him as well. Some of you know him, Dan, Dan Dave. He ended up marrying my sister. 
And you know, they had four sons, and Dan and Noreen, my son, their second son, Philip, is a pastor in America today. Amen. Denise and I have a daughter who is a pastor. I mean, it's just intergenerational, and it all goes back to me forgetting to lock a door. If the hand of God is upon you, if the hand of God is upon you, even your mistakes, even what you forget will be a blessing. Amen.